Hello, I am Roger Congleton, and this is Econ 201H, um, Lecture 8C, uh, which is the third lecture in the uh, chapter on risk. So what I've done first here is kind of write down a bunch of uh, notes um, uh, so that I wouldn't have to write them as I was talking. Um, so this is the first half of the lecture. The first half of the lecture deals with uh, the uh, market for insurance. Uh, and we're going to be building on material that we, we developed in the previous lecture in class. Okay, so uh, if you remember, uh, we went through the idea of risk aversion. Uh, risk aversion means that people, uh, you know, try to avoid risky situations where there's some probability of loss, some probability of a gain. Uh, and, there's, um, um, and they're willing to pay something. They're willing to pay a risk premium to avoid the risk. Well, it's that willingness to pay for a risk premium or a loss premium, if you want to avoid a loss, a potential loss, uh, that uh, creates the demand for uh, insurance. Right? So if I prefer a certain uh, payoff that has a value less than the expected value of some risky choice, um, and then I'm willing to pay the difference between that um, um, uh, risky choice, the expected value of the risky choice, and the... Uh, uh, and the amount of the certainty equivalent. Right, so that risk premium means that people are willing to pay for insurance. Right? Insurance basically uh, eliminates or greatly reduces the loss uh, that one, can, one fronts, right? confronts. So for example, when you buy house insurance, uh, house insurance will uh, you know, uh, essentially pay for a new house if your house should burn down. Uh, and it also deals with a variety of other kind of uh, uh, smaller risks that you might face uh, as a homeowner. If you buy car insurance, uh, if you uh, wreck the car uh, in a way that's not obviously your fault, then the insurance will normally uh, you know, cover the car repairs, fix the car, or replace the car according to the insurance policy that you have. So all this means that the insurance is basically taking away that low, that low end risk, uh, which is partly what generates the, uh, the, uh, uh, the expected value is less than the best possible outcome that you could uh, could confront as a homeowner or car owner or any other kind of owner of any other kind of risky asset, including banks uh, who will buy insurance against default from their uh, uh, customers and taking out loans and so on. So it turns out that the reason there are two reasons why an insurance company might be able to uh, uh, provide uh, their services. One is they may be less risk averse than ordinary uh, consumers are, and so willing to bear more risk, uh, in a sense demanding a smaller risk premium to, to bear the risk than, than a typical consumer would. Uh, and, and, uh, but this is actually a fairly minor reason. Okay? It may happen among, in, in trades among individuals, uh, you know, even family members, uh, uh, regarding various kinds of risks. Uh, but insurance companies mostly <coughs> benefit from the properties of sample variances. So if I buy a whole series of risky things, it's as if I've taken a series of samples. You know, unless I'm, basically, I'm playing the game over and over and over again. So I roll the dice once. Okay, there's a certain variation in the payoffs that could happen. I get one, two, three, four, five, or six. Um, and, that's, and, and whatever I get for that one sample is going to be my average in a sense. If I do two or three or four rolls, okay, then that average is going to be more clustered around 3.5. And the bigger n is, the bigger the, the more times I roll the dice, uh, the nearer that average range uh, tends to be uh, in the sample average, uh, and, and that means the smaller the real risk is. Okay, I don't have to worry about the real low end payoffs as much uh, because the the distribution of payoffs uh, or di distribution of the sample average gets narrower and narrower for the most part. We'll talk more about that in, in a bit. Okay, so sample, the property of sample variances implies that uh, there are advantages to risk pooling, to uh, sharing the risk if you want. And some insurance companies are set up as in the normal corporate way. They provide uh, services and so on, uh, basically risk pooling services. Uh, and others are organized as uh, uh, various kinds of cooperatives and clubs uh, where there's a more formal uh, 
situation or setup or institution that implies risk sharing rather than, than uh, services from some other company uh, taking on the risk bearing services uh, away from consumers. Okay, but basically risk pooling is just a property that's possible. The only reason it really works is because of the properties of sample averages. Okay, so the main property of interest is that this, uh, the variance, the low side, uh, the probability of a, of, a, of a low outcome tends to fall as the sample size increases. And that occurs because, um, uh, in a sense, what you're doing when you, when you sell lots of insurance uh, 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 policies is rolling the dice lots and lots of times and the average result of selling all those policies is going to be the, um, uh, the average result that comes from all those different policies divided by n, right? That will be the sample average. That will be the average loss that you, you bear on all those policies that you sell. And so that's how much money you have to put aside in reserves uh, to uh, cover the, your losses. Okay, so even though uh, insurance has this property that the bigger the company is, the more policies it sells, the larger N is in terms of the number of rolls of the dice. Uh, the, the narrower the variance tends to be, and so the, the less likely it is that really bad outcomes will occur. Um, there's still uh, 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 possibilities of competitive markets for insurance. Right? And that's because, um, although that uh, benefit exists, it's, it's not huge. Okay, once you get up to, say, a million, the reduction in your risk for, from going from a million to a million and one is not very large. Uh, so you can, uh, as you, uh, you can have lots of kind of medium and large companies competing for, uh, 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 in this market for risk pooling services. Uh, and so you can have a quite competitive market for insurance in many states, although there is some tendency, uh, depending on the types of risk being insured, uh, for, uh, 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 for concentration that, you know, relatively few large companies might exist in equilibrium because of the effect of N, you know, number of policies sold uh, on the risks borne by the insurance company. Okay, so to uh, get at the statistics behind insurance, we need to think about variance. Okay, we haven't needed to think about variance before, so this is another concept from statistics. Um, and it's another type of expected value, I guess you could say, but it's talking about the expected deviation from the average of any particular set of draws and any computations that you might make using those different uh, draws out of a sample, rolls of the dice if you want. Uh, and the definition of variance is just basically the probability of event i, okay, times uh, xi, whatever xi is, minus the mean, right, so that's the deviation from the mean, squared. Okay, now why squared? Uh, the simplest reason is that the, the mathematics of squares is easier than the max mathematics of absolute values. Right? So you could just do absolute values of this deviation, and that would give you a term that we call standard deviation. Uh, or uh, you can just square the difference, and then if you want to get this, the, the standard deviation, you just take the square root of the variance okay, and compute it that way. So essentially, this is a way of making the math easier. Uh, the use of squares. Um, uh, and that's, that trick is done in other areas of statistics as well, okay, which are beyond the scope of this chapter and this course, uh, and which you'll, you'll learn when you take some uh, other stat courses. Now, um, so this would be the risk, in a sense, one way of thinking about the risk that a homeowner, a homeowner would bear, right? The, the wider that variance, the bigger the risk. Now, if you look at the, the uh, variance of a sample mean, 
just sort of the average return from this portfolio of, of insurance comp, uh, policies that the insurance company issues. Um, well, that turns out to just be um, the variance of x, this, this over here, divided by n. Right, so the larger the sample size, the smaller that variance. And in terms of a diagram, the way that looks is something like this. All right, so with a relatively small sample, it turns out that the distribution of a sample mean is a normal distribution. And so it has that bell shape. Okay, that you've probably seen before. Uh, and as sample size increases, what happens is that that uh, distribution kind of condenses more and more of its results in one very narrow band. All right, so instead of being really broad and having thick tails, it tends to have a lot of mass in the middle. Uh, most of the out outcomes are in the middle. Uh, and only just a handful, or just a tiny fraction, are, are out in the tails. Um, and, and, and it's because of that reduction in variance, that reduction in risk, uh, that insurance companies uh, make money by offering risk pooling services. They're selling lots and lots of policies. The range of likely outcomes gets narrower and narrower. Uh, and so the, the company can, can very reliably guess how much it's going to need to, to pay off accounts every year. Uh, and it can, you know, sell the insurance at a, at, a, at a price that will generate that reserve necessary to uh, pay all the bills, uh, plus cover the overhead of running the insurance business, uh, selling policies, uh, managing, making sure that people pay for them, uh, and also dealing with claims because some claims, you know, are fraudulent and they need to kind of uh, deal with those kinds of uh, issues uh, in the process of paying out their, uh, their, their insurance uh, promises. Okay, so if we think of the overall market for insurance, which is this diagram, and we assume that there are enough firms in the market so that we can think of it as a competitive market, then we can use the ordinary supply and demand curves that we used in the first um, half of the course uh, to think about the market. Uh, and in this case, because the product uh, being sold is itself in a sense risky, right? You, when you buy insurance, in most cases, you get nothing for it, right? Because the event you're insuring against is not too likely. And so in most cases, if you didn't have the insurance, you wouldn't have a problem anyway. Okay, the house wouldn't burn down, the car wouldn't be in a wreck because you're a careful driver and alert. Uh, uh, and, and so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a claim. Okay, uh, so in many cases, you know, the, uh, the consumer surplus from the insurance policy is zero or negative, right? It's just the peace of mind that it provides, I suppose. Um, and also for most policies, you know, the whole premium is profit for the insurance company. Okay, on the other hand, the insurance company does have to pay out when these uh, somewhat rare events occur. You know, the house burns down, the car's in a wreck, uh, even though the driver was careful and uh, doing uh, all the right things uh, and so forth. Uh, and so uh, those claims have to be paid uh, and it has to come out of the revenue stream uh, provided uh, and, and much of that, uh, uh, you know, and, and, that, and the revenue stream has to be sufficient to, to cover all those claims. So in, in both cases, these are expectations, right? So the demand curve is based on expectations, the ex expected value of the uh, risk in this market uh, uh, and the uh, uh, risk aversion that the individual has that generates the risk premium that uh, different consumers have to, to try to reduce their risk by buying different kinds of insurance. Uh, and uh, the supply curve is based on uh, the expected uh, mean of a, uh, uh, of, a, of a large sample, okay? Okay, uh, and other kind of administrative costs that the company faces. Uh, and obviously this administrative costs vary a bit because insurance companies use slightly different managerial methods, have different accounting methods, and so forth, uh, different skills on their teams. Uh, and so the supplies, supply curves will vary from one company to the other for reasons uh, similar to those we used when we went through the competitive markets using that Ricardian approach that I've used throughout this course. 
And so the result, as a result, these are these areas, uh, instead of being consumer surplus and profit, these are average consumer surplus and average profits, um, expected values, um, uh, calculated roughly in the same way as uh, uh, the expected values we started out with at the beginning of this uh, chapter. Now, if there's monopoly power, okay, in this market, and, uh, and, and because of the effect of N on sample size, there are times of scale, which tends to promote monopoly markets, or at least concentrated markets. Uh, then instead of using uh, this type of supply curve, you should use the monopoly diagram with a margin, expected marginal revenue curve and, and an expected marginal cost curve, uh, and, uh, and figure out the pricing that the monopoly supplier would, uh, uh, would adopt given the availability of, sub, of quite good substitutes for, for, for its insurance policies. Okay, so in one sense, this is an ordinary market. You can think of it as supply and demand, or you can think of it as a monopolistic competition, or you can think of it in some cases as monopolistic, uh, 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 a monopolistic market. Um, the difference is that behind all those curves uh, are some basic ideas from statistics uh, and also some basic ideas about how individuals cope with risks. Uh, and how they cope with risk, the part that's most important is the idea of risk aversion, risk premium, uh, and uh, the possibility of providing this type of product relies for the most part on advantages of risk pool pooling, and the advantage of risk poolings are basically uh, um, associated with the property of sample averages. Uh, namely, that the variance of the distribution of payouts uh, tends to get narrower and narrower as the sample size goes up, as more and more policies are sold, assuming that people, uh, that the, the firm really actually understands the risk that it's insuring. Uh, and as a consequence, firms will have uh, a relatively uh, predictable and fairly narrow range uh, in most circumstances of payouts that they have to make uh, for claims for the insurance that they issue. Now, notice that this type of market would not exist if there were no risks, if people knew exactly whether their house was going to burn down or not, uh, exactly whether there were going to be an accident or not. Uh, uh, you know, then uh, insurance companies could not be profitable. People would just buy insurance when they knew they were going to be in a fire or they knew they were going to be in an accident. It's the fact that people can't really predict whether or not these types of events will occur uh, because they're generated by some kind of random or very complex process. Uh, one that no single individual can fully understand and so is best represented as a kind of probabilistic event, a uh, stochastic uh, uh, event, uh, and therefore a uh, risky event. Uh, uh, and, 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 and their interest in avoiding risks is what leads to the buying by the insurance. The last part is pretty intuitive. I think most of us would understand that. Um, it is also true that in the, in the case of car insurance, there are, there are laws that sort of push people to buy insurance. Uh, and in most states, you can't, buy, you can't drive a car on the road unless you buy insurance or contribute to a state insurance fund. So that's the first half of this, uh, this talk. And the second part of the talk is about... Um, rational ignorance. Okay, and what I've just just jotted down are, uh, is an outline of this part of the of the lecture. 
Okay, so rational ignorance sounds like a contradiction in terms, right? We normally think of people who are ignorant as somehow being foolish, uh, dumb, or uh, basically not very uh, rational in the, in the way that uh, uh, the term rational is used in ordinary English. Um, but if you think about it, uh, we all start out quite ignorant, right? When, we bo when we're born, you know, we don't know our native tongue. We haven't learned, we, you know, we can't speak English if we're born into an English-speaking uh, society. Um, we don't know words. We don't know anything about our opportunities, okay? Um, and gradually we learn these things, okay? These are not uh, inherent in the uh, uh, human genotype. Well, we know that because people speak different languages. Uh, and they dress differently, and they eat different kinds of foods, and all these kinds of things uh, uh, tend to be somewhat location-specific, and that's because uh, in a given location there are lots of people speaking one language, say English in our case, uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, there are lots of facts and ideas about how to live life uh, and what kinds of risks to avoid that are transmitted to individuals uh, you know, when they're children for the most part, but you know, continually through life. Uh, and they learn, uh, and so a lot of what we learn is from other people and from organized education programs like uh, what we're doing here at WVU. Um, so, uh, but even after all that, we still remain ignorant of lots of things, right? So, um, uh, it, it, you know, we are, you know, there are hundreds of languages on the earth that we remain entirely ignorant of. Uh, most of us are, are pretty ignorant about uh, the details of how an automobile operates or a computer operates, so that we know where to put the, you know, how to turn it on, you know, which button to hit or which key to put in uh, to, to cause the machine to go forward or uh, uh, be, at least be able to go forward. Um, but nonetheless, we remain ignorant of all kinds of details that, we, that might be useful to know. Uh, uh, and the idea uh, that economists have come up with uh, and political scientists have come up with to kind of um, analyze this type of, uh, of residual ignorance, um, this, uh, this part of learning where we take an active role in deciding what we're going to learn and what we're not going to learn, uh, is, is an area we call um, rational ignorance. And rational ignorance belongs in uh, this chapter on risk and uncertainty uh, because uh, when, we, when we think about my, uh, acquiring information, right, we have some kind of expected marginal benefit curve. Right? So that expected marginal benefit curve uh, exists because we don't know the value of what we're going to learn until we learn it. Right? There's no way to know before what you don't know right now. Okay, what you can only do is guess or estimate what the uh, extra benefits might be, uh, and or, and, or you, know, you know do that directly yourselves, or you might rely on advice from others uh, about what the probable uh, benefits of learning, you know, taking one course rather than another, for example, while you're at the university. Uh, and there's also an expected marginal cost because you don't know how hard the subject is going to be until you you uh, start working on it. Uh, and the amount of effort that you put into learning uh, the, uh, amount, <coughs> the amount of information that you acquire depends on uh, your expectations about marginal costs and marginal benefits of a particular type of information. Uh, and so you acquire some knowledge, okay, but the knowledge is uh, never as complete as you might like. There's always this extra stuff you could have learned, uh, more time spent in libraries or looking over the websites that uh, deal with the problem or subject that you're interested in, or textbooks. Uh, and so that part of, of information that's available, but you choose not to acquire, it's called rational ignorance. Uh, and there are two types of choice settings that uh, are kind of important. One is the one I've just drawn, and the other one looks more like this. Uh, 
All right, so in the second case, uh, your expected marginal costs are always higher than your marginal benefits, and you don't invest any time and effort in trying to learn that material. Okay, so in terms of college, it's, there are lots of courses on, in the catalog, and, and, um, and presumably you learn something of, of value, or at least of some interest, in each one of those courses. Uh, but there are lots of courses you don't take, right? You don't take them because you don't have enough time. Time is scarce. And time is necessary to engage in information collection and processing and understanding. Uh, and so you have to decide where to allocate your time. Uh, every, every possible course that you could take has an opportunity cost. You're sacrificing some other course or some leisure time uh, or possibly some uh, money earning up possibilities that you have in the local economy. So, uh, so there are some areas where you get absolutely no information, okay? And there are other areas where you get uh, uh, some quantity of information, in some areas a lot more than others because you expect the marginal benefits to be higher or the marginal costs to be lower. And your marginal costs are partly a matter of your preferences you know, and, and partly a matter of your talent and, and training, right? This, uh, you'll find some courses just easier to master than others. And so your marginal cost will be lower in some cases than in others. And ones that you have relatively low marginal cost for because you're quite interested uh, for its own sake, or you, you have uh, uh, just some kind of natural skill at that particular field, uh, you're going to uh, invest more information, more time in that than you will in, in places where your skill set kind of uh, uh, implies that the cost of learning this material is much higher. Um, uh, and so you have a zero case and you have a whole range of cases here where you uh, rationally or uh, self-consciously decide uh, how much time to put, in, how much time and energy to put into various subjects and, and particular types of information even within those sub subjects. So uh, there are a couple of implications, okay, of this, uh, this type of behavior. One is... Um, when you have expectations about how things are going to work out in a particular area, uh, the larger your information set, the more information you've acquired, uh, uh, the narrower the, the, your, your expectations tend to be, and that's the more realistic your expectations about that particular area tend to be. And the less you get, uh, the wider that variance tends to be. Okay, but in either case, as long as you've gotten a kind of a full cross-section of the kind of information you need, uh, your expectations will be unbiased. On average, they'll be right, even though in some cases they'll have quite high variance, in other cases they'll have much narrower uh, variance. On the other hand, in areas where uh, you gather no information, right, you have no basis to form expectations really, just your intuitions and gut, gut feelings, and just other bits of information you might have picked up uh, from others uh, in the course of your life. Uh, and in those areas, the, the existence of bias is quite likely. That is to say, uh, uh, in those areas, you'll be much more likely to make systematic errors than you are in areas like this, okay, where you've done some sampling. So, um, so this is important because uh, in this type of area, uh, you know, you're going to see a lot of mistakes. In this type of area, you may also see mistakes in a sense, okay, but on average, uh, people will be correct. Uh, and uh, this type of model was first developed by a man named George Stigler, who won a Nobel Prize partly for this idea, okay, where he was trying to explain the dispersion of prices in markets. Right? In the mo models that we've had in the first half of the course, uh, we basically assume that markets condense all the way down to a single price. Right? And as a first approximation, that's reasonable. Okay. Uh, but in the real world, if you look around, even gas stations that sell basically the same product often have somewhat different prices. And there's some variation among, around some mean. Uh, and what Stigler was interested in is, okay, well, what generates the variant variance, right? And there are some areas uh, of, of markets where prices seem to vary quite a lot for essentially the same products. Uh, and he wanted to understand that uh, 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 how that price dispersion might uh, occur. And essentially, he argued it had to do with the shopping decisions, right? So the bigger, the more, the more uh, stores that a, uh, or vendors that a, uh, an average consumer looked at before buying, 
the better their estimate of the lowest price for that service they would have. Uh, and so he basically argued that information costs, which is this marginal cost E curve in, in my diagram, uh, is really important. And that the higher that information costs, uh, the more variance in, around prices, uh, uh, you know, in, in market prices you observe, and the lower the uh, marginal cost of information, the narrower that distribution of prices tends to be, and the more it looks like that perfect competition uh, result that we've we uh, developed in the first half of the course. So uh, this type of logic provides an explanation for random events in markets that are actually pretty well functioning. Okay, so you don't necessarily have shocks and have to have shocks from outside to have prices jumping around a little bit. Uh, it's enough to, that people don't do a complete job of searching uh, and that there's not enough price pressure on firms in the market to cause all the prices to converge to a single price. Uh, instead, you'll see it's kind of a little ball of prices around the equilibrium price. There's some variation because some consumers, you know, pay more than they could have paid. Uh, and, and essentially, in a sense, they bought the product from, uh, in a sense, the wrong, wrong place. Uh, now, if you think about this sort of phenomenon, uh, the uh, one of the things that happened with uh, the, uh, uh, the development of Amazon as a major uh, internet retail outlet uh, is it became much easier to search, right? So that marginal cost of learning about prices and to some extent quality, although it's, you can't always tease out all the qualities you'd like uh, by reading a website uh, ad. Uh, so, uh, but to a large extent, at least in terms of price information, that marginal cost went down. And so the advent of uh, this highly developed uh, website uh, should have caused uh, the variance of prices to converge uh, towards that single price equilibrium that we used in the first part of the, the semester. Um, on the other hand, there are still places like this where we don't, uh, even though the information costs are much lower than they used to be to learn things, there are lots of things we don't learn. Uh, and in those areas, we're going to be uh, certainly not experts uh, and much more likely to be um, uh, incorrect in our guesses about how things operate. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's basically uh, the complexity of the world, the huge number of different things we could potentially learn that makes ignorance uh, uh, occur. If we could learn everything there was to, to know uh, in a fairly short uh, uh, process of education, say, you know, first through eighth grade, uh, then we would all enter the world perfectly informed uh, uh, as grown-ups. Uh, and, uh, you know, none of this would be relevant. Okay. It's the fact that the world has lots of things that, uh, that one could learn uh, that uh, these types of choices uh, confront us all the time. Uh, and that, you know, in some areas we may be a little bit uncertain about things. Okay. Um, but on average, we're going to get the right result in terms of our own preferences okay, and, and aspirations. But there are other areas where uh, that's not going to happen because we remain completely ignorant. So with that, um, I'll complete this lecture. Uh, we've got the main points across that I wanted to. Uh, for more information, go uh, look at the, uh, the, the web notes on this uh, uh, blocking material. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, this has been pretty clear to you. Um, if not, uh, you can email me questions and I'll try to respond within a, a short period of time while I'm traveling uh, in the next, for the next 10 days. So, take care.